Hello and welcome to today's Q&A Live. My name is Rebecca and I work at OET for the education team here in Melbourne in Australia. And I'm looking forward to being with you for the next 60 minutes to answer any questions you might have about getting ready for your OET test. The format for how this session works is incredibly simple. Uh, you can simply ask your question that you'd like me to answer live into the chat box of either YouTube or Facebook, depending on where you're st streaming the session from today. I pick up those questions and I work my way through as many of them as I can, as I say, in the next 60 minutes. Uh, you might be completely new to OET. You might have decided as a New Year's resolution that you're going to try and improve your career prospects, look for a job overseas, and you're just trying to find out a little bit more about how OET can help you to do that. You might be someone who's already been preparing for OET in the last part of 2022, and now your test date is coming closer. So whatever stage you are in that preparation process, uh, you can ask me any question that you like about listening, speaking, reading or writing, tips, strategies, um, things that you're not really sure you understand, anything that you like. And uh, as I say, I'll work my way through as many of them as I can. So I can see we've already got uh, some questions coming through. Let's have a look at uh, what we have. All right. So hello to everybody joining today. Uh, let's start with this question on YouTube from Mahesh, who says, how much marks do I need to get a B score? So candidates who are aiming to use OET results for registration purposes are generally aiming uh, at a 350 uh, or a B grade. Now, when you receive your OET results, you receive what we call a numerical score, which is out of 500. And as I mentioned, a 350 is usually the score that candidates are going for. And you also receive a letter grade. So uh, there are boundaries of numerical score, for example, um, a 350 to uh, a 450 is a B grade and 350 is right at the bottom of that. So candidates, um, when they're using those results, are often asked by the regulator for a particular letter grade. Um, but using the numerical score helps you to see how close you were perhaps to the next grade boundary or where within um, the grade boundary your skills sit and which of your skills uh, of listening, reading and writing are perhaps stronger or weaker than the others. Now, in terms of how many marks do you need to get uh, correct to get a B grade, it's not an exact science. I can't tell you you need to get this many questions correct um, to definitely get a 350, a B grade, because each OET test is unique. Uh, a new test is written for every date that OET is available using different questions and different topics. And for that reason, there isn't a set pass score. Uh, the passing score is based on that actual test that you sit, and it might be slightly higher or slightly lower than another test that is sat by another candidate on a similar, uh, in a different uh, date. Now, the way that that works, though, to make sure nobody is disadvantaged, is that uh, that slight fluctuation means that if your test questions are perhaps slightly easier than another test, you would be required to score slightly higher. Uh, and the same is true if those test questions were slightly harder, you would be expected to score slightly lower and you'd still end up at that same level. So it, it's all carefully considered and standardized to make sure every candidate has um, the, the same opportunity of getting the score that they want on test day. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of extra information. This question from Hassan, also on YouTube, says, does the accent matter in the speaking test? So in your speaking test, you're being assessed on nine assessment criteria. And one of those, the first one of the linguistic criteria is called intelligibility. And intelligibility simply means how clear your speaking is, how clear it is for the assessor or the patient um, in your role play to understand what it is that you're saying. And uh, your accent does come into that only in terms of the clarity though. So you don't have to 
try and minimize or rule out your uh, accent. We love hearing different accents at OET and it's part of the multicultural world that we live in. The only thing you need to be careful of is perhaps where some sounds are not so easy for you to pronounce or where there might be some um, misunderstanding between your pronunciation of a word and the pronunciation of the word as the patient would expect to hear it. Those are things that you need to, to take into account with your accent, just to make sure it's absolutely clear uh, for the uh, assessor, for the patient to be able to understand you. But specifically, it's not um, assessed on its own. It's, it's part of this um, criteria of intelligibility. So how clear is it uh, to, to understand you? And, and uh, accent is only one part of that criterion. Aya is asking on YouTube for tips for reading. Now, there are a couple of great resources that I can point you to if you're looking for specific tips uh, to help you get ready for a particular part of OET. So the first thing that I'm going to recommend are our masterclasses. These are short videos. They're about 20 minutes long. And there's one for each of the uh, skills, uh, listening, reading, writing, and speaking. And these are freely available from the OET website. And I'm posting the link to those masterclass videos uh, into the chat now so that you can see them and bookmark them to visit later. So these masterclass videos go through each part of the test, talking about uh, what's involved in the test, uh, what's being assessed and what skills you're going to need to be able to score highly in each part of the test. So they're a really good introduction um, if you're new to OET. If you're a little bit more familiar with OET and you're finding that you've improved to a certain level, but you could do now with improving a little bit further uh, and you're not able to, to do that by yourself, um, I'll recommend this reading playlist to you. And again, I'm posting the link for the playlist into the chat uh, now. Uh, let me just give that a title so people know uh, what it is. So reading playlist, um, and there's a link to a YouTube playlist uh, completely full of tips and strategies from our all-star provider partners. So the all-stars, as you're probably aware, stream live uh, on our social media channels. We have a couple of live sessions a week. And these are really great sessions uh, for you to be able to learn from experts about how to do really well in your OET test. And we've compiled um, a series of the best sessions from the All Stars covering reading. And that's what I've linked for you into the chat now. Uh, so I see a couple of other candidates asking similar questions about reading. So that playlist, I think, will be useful for all of you. Now, Rena Rose, I think, is asking a follow up question uh, to the one that I was asked, answering earlier about how many marks you need to get to score a B grade. And I was explaining that uh, for each test, there isn't a set pass score. Uh, for listening and reading, as Renda Rose mentioned, there are always 42 questions and each question is worth one point. There are no half marks available and there's no negative marking. So you don't get uh, marks removed if you get a question wrong. So the way that the assessment works for listening and reading is that all the questions that you got correct from parts A, B and C are totaled together. And that is then fed through uh, the, the process, as I mentioned, of making sure the test is standardized by slightly raising or lowering the pass uh, level for that particular test. The recommendation that we give candidates for listening and reading is that you want to be scoring using official practice tests um, 30, 31, 32 consistently in your practice. And that would then suggest that you're ready to book and sit OET. If you're sometimes getting, let's say, 31 and you're sometimes getting 26, uh, that would suggest you still need to do a little bit more work on those skills. Really wait until you're consistently scoring 
um, 30, 31, 32 before you book your test. And also think of that as the minimum. Um, we obviously recommend for the best test day experience possible that even if you are hitting those scores now consistently, don't just stop there before your test. Keep working on those skills uh, and try and increase them further because the, the more that you can improve your skills between now and test day, the more comfortable and confident you can feel on test day that you're going to get the score that you want for success. Blessing on YouTube says, what is the right format for writing the date of birth in the writing task? Now, more than one convention can be used uh, for date of birth. Um, if you're talking about the actual phrase date of birth, it's quite standard in the reference line of the OET letter, which is the RE line, the letter starting, uh, the line starting RE, followed by the patient's name, then it's quite standard to just write as an abbreviation DOB. And you can include full stops between the letters uh, D and O and B, or no full stops without punctuation. Both are acceptable. So you can write date of birth in that line, the reference line simply as DOB, that's a very commonly understood um, abbreviation. And then the actual date of birth, it's normal to write in digits, uh, perhaps separated by a slash or a full stop. So for example, today's date would be written in the British English format of 25 dot or slash one dot or slash 2023. Now, if you are more familiar with American date formats, which put the month before the day of the week, you are able to use American date formats throughout your letter. Uh, but just two little points to uh, make around that. Make sure you use the same format of date throughout the letter. So don't sometimes switch between American and British English date formats. Use the same date format throughout your letter. And the second point is just to be aware that OET uses British English as standard, including the British English date format. So if you are using American format in your letter, just make sure that you're not making any mistakes when you change the date from how it's written in the case notes into the American format for your letter. Um, Pearl on YouTube says, can you please explain some more strategies for listening part A? So I can indeed. Let me bring up my page of tips and I'll just hide uh, the question as well um, so that you can see the tips. So for listening part C, slightly longer recordings than compared to part B, similar in length though to the part A recordings that you hear. And like part A, there are two uh, listening part C audios. And one of the audios is likely to be a presentation by a healthcare professional. And the other audio is likely to be an interview of a healthcare professional. But it could be two presentation tasks, two interview tasks, or one of each. Uh, there's flexibility there. But you're listening to two healthcare professionals talk about their work, perhaps uh, some new research that they've been involved with, or uh, just explaining more details about the work that they do as perhaps a specialist in their area. And you have six questions to ask about each of those audios. And before the audio starts, you have 90 seconds to read the questions and the three answer options that go with each question. So my first tip, uh, and it's a really important one, is actually to make use of that reading time and make use of it really effectively. Um, understanding the question, what you're listening for, also checking out what question uh, words are being used will really help you to focus while you're listening on, on answering the question correctly, but also will help you know when the audio is moving on to the next question because you'll spot uh, words that you've previously been seeing in the, the next question being said uh, by the speaker or the interviewer. So use that reading time effectively to really make sure you understand the question 
and to look at the three answer options and try and identify something about them that is different from the other two answer options. The best strategy would really be to identify one or two key words that really make the answer different to the other answer options. And then it's those differences that you're going to focus on listening for when the audio starts, rather than trying to read and listen to everything uh, as in one go. My next tip is to make sure that you keep your focus. And this is uh, perhaps a little bit harder than it sounds. Personally speaking, whenever I try a, a listening part C um, set of questions, I find my mind has a tendency to, to wander off somewhere else because you're listening quite intensively to um, some interesting information, but it's quite technical, uh, it's quite high level information. So um, your mind will prefer to be a bit more lazy than that. And it, as I say, has this tendency to wander off. And of course, if you're not focused really carefully throughout, um, the, the audio, you could miss important information, which will either prove to be the correct answer, or it could be information that uh, eliminates one of the other answer options, which obviously is useful for then helping you select the final correct answer. So keeping your focus and practicing that, uh, practice developing your stamina to listen for five minutes at a time fairly intensively. And my third tip, is to move on to the next question with the audio. So don't stay put, even if you're not 100% sure on what the answer is for that question. When you realize you hear that the audio is moving on to the next question, you need to make a decision on that previous question and move on with the audio so that you don't lose out the opportunity for getting that answer correct. All of the questions are independent, so you don't need to have answered the previous question correctly to be able to answer the next question. So moving on is important. All right. Hopefully those tips were helpful. Uh, let's have a look um, for the next question, which uh, comes from Tahajud, who says, can I use the word unfortunately in writing? Now, unfortunately, um, is a word that would be very commonly used in speaking, particularly when speaking with a patient or perhaps also when speaking to a colleague. When we're speaking, it's much more usual for us to show emotion um, and in, in terms of unfortunately to show regret for a particular situation. But the same isn't true for writing. When we're writing, we're much more objective we stick to the facts, uh, we provide the information that the reader needs to be able to continue care. And we don't need to include emotional words uh, like, unfortunately, um, the reader would be able to understand from the rest of the sentence that this situation is obviously unfortunate for the patient, um, but they don't need to have that emotional level added. Um, it's not helping them uh, understand the information more clearly or able to provide the patient with any different type of care. So it's not recommended to include, unfortunately, in your writing. It's not particularly needed. Uh, Fahad is asking about the remarking process. Uh, so um, in a score uh, or in the first uh, submission, um, he says he received uh, a 330 and after remarking it reduced to 250. Now I can't uh, comment specifically on your scenario, Fahad, because I haven't seen either of uh, your scores or your assessment. However, it is possible for scores to go down as well as to go up. Uh, it's not usual for scores to change quite so significantly as yours has done. Uh, but where such a significant uh, score is received during remarking, it will have gone through extra checks um, before it is released to you to make sure that revised score is in fact the, the correct one. 
um, because of that uh, change in the score. So it is important to understand if you are considering uh, remarking that most of the time scores, particularly letter grades, do not change at all. Um, and then it may be that they change by 10 or 20 points and that could be up or down. So you're not necessarily going to stay the same or increase your score. It is possible that your score could be reduced. Got a long question here from Ziel on Facebook. Let's just see if I can quickly skim it and understand uh, what the question is. Um, so it's around making sure um, I have filled in the correct answer. From from what I'm reading, Ziel, these are not official OET questions um, because the way that they have been written uh, isn't uh, something that uh, uh, an OET question would ask or phrase in exactly that way. Uh, but I think the point that you're trying to make uh, is do you need to repeat words that are in the question um, in your answer for OET reading part A? And the answer to that is uh, no, um, you're not expected to include um, the, the question words. So if it's asking, for example, for a type of cholesterol, sorry, you don't need to include cholesterol. I'm having a trouble with that word. You don't need to include the word cholesterol in your answer because it was included in the question. You only need to write the type. Um, so this video that I'm posting into um, the chat now, and I'll just title it Reading Part A. Uh, this is a really great video that we produced a year ago, and it explains um, where some of the common mistakes are that candidates make with their answers for Reading Part A, including um, using words from the question as part of their answer. Uh, so for any of you feeling unsure about um, how reading part A works or how to improve your score, there are always a few little marks that candidates lose, perhaps due to lapses in spelling or um, problems copying the answer from the uh, text. So that video will be really useful for those of you. Um, Bisma is asking on YouTube, can you give me some tips to manage reading part A within 15 minutes? Uh, for longer text, it's a bit hard. So I just want to pick up on the second part of your question, Bisma, because uh, sometimes candidates are using unofficial OET test materials that don't follow the format of the test. Now, for OET reading part A, uh, as you mentioned, there are always four texts and you have 15 minutes to answer the 20 questions. Um, but those four texts will always be in total of the same length. So, so they will always fit across two pieces of paper uh, if you were to print them out. So it could be that you have maybe a slightly shorter text and a slightly longer text, but in total, the word length is always the same from test to test. So when a candidate says the texts were too long or the font was too small. Um, these things are standardized uh, to make sure that the test is of a similar difficulty from test to test. So you're never going to get um, texts that go onto three pages or texts that are particularly small to get more words included or particularly large um, to, to cover more space. There's always standardized um, approaches taken to, to writing the test. Uh, so my tips for completing reading part A within 15 minutes is actually to forget about the time. I think a lot of candidates put unnecessary pressure on themselves by continually checking how much time they have left. So they look up at the clock at the front of the room or they're looking on their screen to see the countdown timer that's visible to them. And that interrupts your, your reading fluency um, by looking away from what you're doing from looking away from the question, um, it interrupts your reading fluency. So the advice is ignore the time, focus on what it is that you're doing, work from the beginning, start with question one and work steadily through the questions one by one, uh, moving on if, 
one question doesn't quickly come to you what the answer is going to be uh, so that you've answered all of the questions within the time limit and then you can circle back and see if you've got time to answer any of the remaining questions after that. Samicha on YouTube says, for the writing part, after I've written yours sincerely, do we have to leave a line and then write our name? You're not alone in feeling confused about that question. So at the end of the letter, as you mentioned, it's standard to include a closing salutation, for example, yours sincerely. And then after that, you're expected to write your job title as given um, in the notes at the start of the, uh, the, case, no uh, the case notes. Um, it's not essential that you get your job title exactly correct. You could just write nurse, for example, or doctor or physiotherapist, depending on what your profession is for OET. Uh, you just need to write down your job title. It is standard to include a blank line between the salutation and your job title. But again, it's not critical that you do that. You won't be penalized if you forget to include a blank line. And there's certainly no requirement for you to add your name. You would do that, of course, in a real letter, but for testing purposes, uh, it's not required. So you just need to write the salutation and uh, your job title. Nadisha on Facebook is saying, why do candidates need more attempts to get a B grade in the test? Well, usually the reason that candidates need more than one attempt at the test is because their language level wasn't quite at the right level to begin with. So a lot of candidates are very excited about the idea of getting a new job overseas. They're perhaps being um, encouraged to get a new job overseas by an employer or a recruitment agency who found them a great job already in the country where they wish to work. Uh, and so they get into taking the test before they have really fully prepared for it or perhaps done the necessary adjustments to their current language level to be able to get the scores that those regulators are going to need for registration to that job that the employer or the recruitment agency have offered to them. So it's really important to be realistic. Um, yes, it's exciting. And yes, of course, you want to take this opportunity as quickly as possible. But it's false economy to take the test before you have properly prepared for it. So do make sure that you take your time over the preparation. Uh, it will be quicker in the long run if you uh, take the time, prepare properly, uh, and then take your test uh, once you know you have the skill level required for registration purposes. The other reason that candidates may not get the scores that they want on first time around can come down to their test taking skills. For some of you, it might be quite a number of years since you were last in an examination hall or took uh, some kind of really important exam. And of course, it's very natural to feel nervous about doing that. And you might find uh, that when you get into your test, uh, your nerves get the better of you, essentially, and you're distracted by being in the testing environment um, and you don't perform as well as you could do or you have been doing in your classroom or when you're preparing by yourself. So it is important to consider test taking skills, consider strategies to help manage nerves um, mindfulness and uh, relaxation techniques are really useful. Making sure you uh, are calm and have had a good night's sleep before the test day and, and that sort of thing. So being realistic about your level and also making sure you've got some good test taking strategies uh, are two ways uh, to help you get the, the results you want uh, the first time around. Uh, Kumar on YouTube says, uh, why are candidates not allowed to see the clock during the speaking? It's an essential part of time management during role play. It's a, a great question and a very understandable question. But uh, as I was just saying to do with reading part A, um, when you keep checking the time, it interrupts uh, your reading fluency. And for similar reasons, if you were constantly checking the time in the speaking test, 
it would interrupt not only your speaking fluency, but also the relationship that you're trying to build uh, with the patient. And of course, checking the time when you're speaking to a patient is not something that you would do or be encouraged to do uh, in real life. It would be considered quite rude and unprofessional to be with a patient and be checking your watch or looking at the clock uh, to see how much time you have left. So for both of those good reasons, you're not able to see the time uh, in the test. Instead, as part of your preparation, uh, this is something that you need to practice and to become familiar with how long five minutes feel. Um, and you will get a sense of that. The more that you practice speaking for five minutes, having a conversation for five minutes, you do start to get an internal sense of how long five minutes is. And another tip uh, that can help you with your time management is during the three minutes preparation time that you have, just to allocate each of the tasks on your roll card, a very rough time limit. Some of the tasks can be completed quite quickly, perhaps in a minute or less. Other tasks might need a little bit longer because you're trying to persuade the patient to do something. You're having to explain a process to them. So by identifying which of the tasks can be done more quickly and which ones more slowly, uh, that can also help you manage your time and move quickly through the ones that can be done quickly and still then have time to spend on the ones that are going to need a little bit longer. All right, let's have a look uh, for some other questions. So Chatula on YouTube says, how can I get a listening practice test? Well, the place that you need to visit is the OET prepare page, uh, part of the OET website. And I'll post a link uh, into the chat now, which is a link to the OET website, to our prepare page. On this page, you will find free official sample tests, those masterclass videos that I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, the, the writing guide uh, that's a really great resource for those of you working on your writing and much more. So it's a really good page to visit, not just for the sample test, but for all of the other preparation materials available there. Uh, Ria has a similar question about um, more samples available. Um, Ria, there aren't further free sample tests, but there are a lot of really good uh, materials available to purchase through the OET shop. Uh, these include uh, official practice test books for each of the OET professions and some course books. So if you're needing to improve on some of your skill areas, these course books can be really useful. They use test questions and often include practice tests at the back, but they break down those test questions into the skills that you need to answer those questions correctly and help you learn and develop yourself ready for your test. Uh, Hannah is saying, is there any possibility of rebooking the test a few days before the test date? Um, Hannah, I'm not exactly sure of your question there um, around rebooking, um, but just to mention at this point for any candidate uh, who has questions around their test booking or their results or their ID or anything else like that, uh, the best place to answer those questions is with our customer care team and using live chat. So live chat is available 24 hours a day, Monday to Friday, and you can access live chat from uh, the OET website. And um, from the OET website, look out for the blue chat with an expert button. Clicking on that button will start a live chat with one of our customer care team. And you can ask them these questions about booking, rebooking, remarking, um, uh, what else was I saying just now? Um, your test day schedule, all of those sorts of questions, your ID, uh, you can ask our customer care team and they will be able to help you. Nixie is asking a question about punctuation. Do we need to put a comma before the postal code or the pin code? Um, in the address, uh, punctuation is optional. Um, in your writing task, commas will be provided between different lines of the address so that you know 
how to organize that address on the page. However, you don't have to co copy those commas from the writing task into your address. The commas are optional. Daniel on Facebook is saying, if I don't get the grades I need, how soon can I book my next test? So Daniel, the um, answer is as soon as you like. We do recommend uh, that candidates wait and get their test results before booking another test, partly because uh, you may have done better than perhaps you thought you did or you scored exactly as you'd hoped and uh, you don't need another test. So it's always a good idea to get your test results before booking another test. And as well as that, once you've got your results, you can obviously see where your strengths and weaknesses are and which of the skills you're going to need to work on. And perhaps if there are some skills that are a long way from the, the test score that you require for registration, uh, the sensible option would be to pause, do some work on those skills, and then think about rebooking the test uh, once you've done that work. So not rushing into rebooking your test until you've had your results and until you know um, what your strengths and weaknesses are, so you know what you need to improve on. Steffi on YouTube says, what is the format for writing the age in the OET letter? So our recommendation is including the patient's age in your letter is optional. It's a way of uh, humanizing the patient for the reader uh, during the introduction of your letter. Um, but we would only ever recommend you include the age if it's given for you in the case notes. We wouldn't ever recommend calculating the patient's age based on their date of birth and the date that the letter is set, because that's wasting valuable seconds while you work out what the, the age is. And potentially you could make a mistake there. So it's not uh, a good use of your time. If the age is provided for you, then as I say, including it as part of the introduction is absolutely fine if you feel uh, that's a nice detail for the reader to know. Um, but it, it, it is optional. You don't have to include uh, the age. Indu is saying, is it OK to include a sentence in OET like he was managed conservatively? It's OK in as far as if this is accurate for the case notes that you have been provided with. If this is a good summary of what um, has been given to you in the case notes, then you can, of course, use it in your letter. However, a couple of things to think about here. Uh, your job is to communicate the information uh, provided in the case notes. You're not required to interpret it. Uh, so if um, you are making the decision that having read the case notes, this treatment was conservative. You really interpreted the case notes there, and that's not something that you are required to do. You are simply required to communicate the information that has been given to you. The second thing to think about is uh, avoiding template sentences. So template sentences are perfect English. They look good. They read well but can be very inappropriate for the situation that you're writing about. If this wasn't part of the case notes and you're just including it as a template phrase, it will stand out to the assessors as uh, some, a weakness in your ability to write a letter that is suitable and personalized uh, for the reader rather than a generic letter that you have already learned off by heart. Uh, Dr. Frankie on YouTube says, if someone fails one part of the test but passes the other parts, uh, do you have to retake the entire test? This comes down to the regulator that you are applying to with your OET results. Uh, the regulators make the decision about what scores are required, uh, what combination of scores they might accept, and, and things like how many parts of the test have to be taken again if you don't get all of the scores that you want first time around. Now, most OET regulators um, do require candidates to resit all parts of the test if they don't get the scores required first time around. Um, so the best thing to do is to visit um, the page of our website which talks about who recognizes OET. 
Um, I'll find that page and link to it now. Um, this list of regulators um, with, includes details to their websites and contact addresses. You can have a look on their website for what their requirements are in terms of grades that you need, but also what they're going to require if you do need to have uh, to resit your test. Uh, Dunya on YouTube says, when we write uh, the, the date of the letter, do we write the date of the test day, the exam day, or the date of the last visit? Actually, Dunya, it's neither of those two options. Um, at the top of the OET case notes is a sentence which says, assume that today's date is, and it provides you with the date, and that is the date that you will use uh, at the start of your letter and use to construct the timeline of, of events um, for the rest of the content of your letter. So it's given to you specifically, and you can see this on all official OET sample tests, that same sentence, assume that today's date is, is included in, on all of our official practice materials. All right, I'm just scrolling down now to find um, some new questions and some questions that have come in a little bit more recently. Um, here's a question from Sheila on Facebook, who says, what are the words or phrases that should not be mentioned in speaking or writing? Well, the good news is there isn't particularly a list of words that should be uh, used or avoided. It's all really down to your own communication and making sure you're communicating the information accurately in either the speaking or the writing tests. So in the speaking test, of course, you're speaking with a patient and the style of your speaking should be professional, uh, but perhaps slightly less formal than the tone of your writing. So you're speaking professionally in a friendly and warm manner uh, but without too much formality so that you choose language appropriate to that tone of voice for speaking and in the writing test uh, the formality is higher you're writing to a healthcare colleague perhaps a colleague uh, that you uh, know well or someone that you are unfamiliar with uh, but you are making a referral to them so the formality is higher uh, of course, you're writing in complete sentences. You might be using complex connectors and so forth to combine the information clearly for that reader. So it's important to think about what is the style of communication. And it's quite different from speaking to writing. And so there should be clear differences between the way that you complete the speaking test and the writing test. Uh, Gaines on Facebook says, is there a difference in time given for the exams on paper versus computer, especially for sections like writing? Great question and very understandable if you are making your mind up about which format of the test that you want to take, either OET on paper or OET on computer. And the answer is uh, no, there are no differences between the time allowed for any part of the test. Uh, the questions are also exactly the same. Um, the requirements for the questions, the way that you answer the questions is also the same. The key difference, of course, is on paper, you are handwriting your responses and on computer, you are typing your responses. But in terms of all other aspects of the test, it's exactly the same. Uh, Janice on Facebook says, for writing, do I need to introduce myself or just get straight to the point? This is um, hard for me to answer generically because it will really depend on why you're writing to the reader and whether they need to know who you are uh, in relation to uh, the, the patient and their care. Now, I can think of a few scenarios where an introduction could be useful. So for example, you might have provided emergency treatment to a patient who has been on holiday and you're now uh, transferring 
uh, the patient back to their regular pro healthcare professional, in which case just introducing that you have treated this patient during their holiday uh, by way of an introduction could be relevant uh, in your introduction. However, for other situations, it's not really important uh, for the, the um, reader to know exactly who you are. They don't need to know your name, for example. Uh, so it's all about, and this is true for all aspects of the writing test, really understanding the writing task and what information it is you need to communicate so that the reader can continue care for the patient. Um, this question from Olu Walana on YouTube says, if letter S or ED is supposed to be included in the listening answer, but these were missed by the student, would it be marked wrongly? Again, I can't give you a definitive answer, I'm afraid. Uh, there will be some scenarios where the, that will be marked incorrect if you are missing those endings from your answer, uh, particularly for answers that are very straightforward, um, not a particularly challenging answer to write down, you know, a very common word that you would be expected to know how to spell correctly and, and so on. The, the flexibility for the assessors in terms of scoring your answers for listening really comes uh, for those answers that are a little bit more complex, the word is less familiar um, or more difficult to spell than sort of the regular uh, level, B level words that um, are through the majority of the test. So it is important that you try and spell as accurately as possible. And of course, as you're uh, writing your answers while you're listening, you may not be able to spell 100% accurately at that time. So then using the time provided to check your answers is the point where you go back through your spelling and try and make sure that you have uh, been as accurate as you can. Chaka on YouTube says, can you please give some states in the US who acknowledge OET? Thank you. So we're, we're seeing an increasing number of uh, states recognizing OET uh, in the USA. And the link that I provided to a little bit earlier for who recognizes OET would be a good place to start with. Uh, OET has been recognized by two really important organizations the CGFNS uh, for nurses and the ECFMG for uh, doctors. And those two organizations, of course, really hold the key to um, progressing to the next stage of uh, the match for, for doctors or visa screen and, and getting um, registered for nurses. On top of that, we have recognition for nurses in Florida, Oregon, Washington, Michigan, Arkansas and Massachusetts, and those can all be seen on uh, the OET website. Uh, and additionally to that, you may be familiar with uh, the compact nursing state list that's available in America. This allows um, nurses who have got registration in one particular state uh, to be able to then move and work in another state. Um, using that same registration. So it could be that uh, the, the individual state doesn't yet recognize OET results, but they are recognizing the CGF and S visa screen or through the compact, uh, the, the registration that you could achieve from one of the states that is already accepting OET results. So there's great options available for both doctors and nurses uh, in, uh, in the US. And a sort of follow up question to that is uh, from Nadimbari, who says, is OET used in Canada? So similarly for doctors, OET is recognized by all the provincial um, medical boards in Canada. And we are working hard to gain recognition for nurses in Canada, because we know that would be a really popular option for a lot of our candidates. So that's something we're actively working on now. We're in discussion with various um, 
immigration boards, government representatives and so forth. Um, these things do take time and as soon as we have any news we'll be excited to share it with you. Um, Bawana on YouTube is saying in listening part A are answers paraphrased for some question uh, and does the answer come serially or do we need to read the question back and forth to find the answer? All right, so two parts to that question. Uh, the first part is no, the answers should not be paraphrased. The instructions are that you um, write what you hear on the audio. So you use a word or short phrase uh, to write exactly the words that you hear from the audio. So do not paraphrase your answers. And secondly, uh, the answers do come in order. So you are going from the start to the finish and once you've uh, found the answer to the question. Uh, you don't need to recall any previous details. The audio will keep going and the answers will follow sequentially. Rhonda on Facebook says, I find it difficult to determine uh, between a referral and a discharge letter. So referral letters uh, are generally those where you are introducing the patient to somebody new involved in their care. So they don't know the reader. Um, that's a really clear way of understanding uh, a, a referral letter. And conversely, a discharge letter is when you are handing back the patient, so to speak, to the person who was previously caring for them. So you can look at it as sort of two sides of the coin. Referring is introducing the patient and then discharge is when they return back to the original point of care. Anna on Facebook um, says, in listening, do we answer on the question paper or is there a separate answer sheet? You answer directly onto the question paper. There are gaps provided or you shade in uh, the circle on the question paper for parts B and C as you listen. Um, if you're taking it on computer, you type and choose your answer as you listen, but from the question paper. Uh, Reza on Facebook says, is there a number of words required in the writing test? There is a guided word limit, and that guided word limit is between 180 to 200 words. And that word limit is for the body of the letter, uh, which are the paragraphs of your letter. So only the paragraphs are included within that guide. And the reason that we provide a guide is so that you are producing uh, the correct amount of words in the time limit that you have available. So you have 40 minutes to write your letter and between 180 to 200 words is entirely feasible for somebody at the level required for OET to produce in that amount of time and to help you complete the writing task effectively because there will be parts of the case notes that you should omit uh, that are not necessary for the reader to have in the letter and also you're trying to summarize the information so you're trying to write succinctly in as few words as possible uh, which is something valued by healthcare professionals things like the address the greeting the closing they're not included in the word limit that is provided and you don't have to hit it exactly uh, it's a guide the assessors are not counting your words individually during uh, the assessment of your writing. Um, so just roughly speaking, that is the guide to help you uh, to score well in OET. All right, I'm just going to answer a couple more questions and then I will tell you about what is coming up next. Uh, this question from Dan on Facebook says, can I use cursive handwriting in the listening and writing subtest? Yes, absolutely, you can, Dan, and in reading as well. Um, the only thing we say about handwriting is make sure you are clear in your handwriting. And that's particularly important, perhaps, with the, the last couple of letters, the ends of words. Don't sort of write the first part of the word really clearly and then sort of trail off for the end. Make sure the whole word is really clear for the assessor to understand. If your writing is clear, it can be written cursively in print, in capitals, 
however you prefer. Uh, Rhonda says, is it better to cross out the wrong answer and replace with the correct one or just erase it and write the correct one? Either of those options are completely fine. Um, I'm not going to say one is completely better than the other. Perhaps in terms of speed, it could be quicker just to cross through and write rather than erase and write again, but both are absolutely fine. And really it comes down to your preference, what you feel more comfortable with, how you've been preparing and practicing for OET. All right, um, I'm going to answer one last question. Um, this one from Dilpa, who says, if we write information that should have been omitted in the letter, will our marks be reduced or not? So Dilpa, um, one of the assessment criteria for writing is called conciseness and clarity. And this assessment criteria is focusing on have you summarized the task effectively for the reader by omitting information that isn't relevant to the current situation or how the reader is going to continue care for the patient. So if you haven't done that, it will affect your mark for that particular criterion. However, if the rest of your letter, the other criteria are all scored really highly, on balance, you could still end up with uh, the score that you want uh, for registration purposes. So obviously, be really familiar with the assessment criteria. Um, and I'm going to link to the page where you can find those assessment criteria uh, and you can download them, bookmark them, keep them somewhere that you can refer to. Um, uh, make sure you're working to score as highly as possible across all of the assessment criteria um, so that you can relax uh, on test day. So I want to just mention, I, I talked earlier about our all-star preparation partners and the fact that they do live sessions uh, coming up um, uh, every week. Uh, so tomorrow we have a session from SET English, which is all about forming questions for the speaking test. So that will be a really useful session. And then uh, next week, uh, we've got a session from Kara uh, English, uh, who are going to be doing a topic on using appropriate language in writing, which was something that we did discuss a little bit earlier. And then also IRS group are going to be doing uh, a session on um, how to communicate effectively with patients without being judgmental. So two really great sessions there. Uh, I'm sure you won't want to miss. And in terms of the next Q&A live session, if you've enjoyed today's session, uh, the next session is going to be um, in a couple of weeks time on the 7th of February. And my colleague Shekina will be running that session. Um, so do join her for that uh, Q&A live session uh, if you would like to ask more questions or to hear the kinds of questions that other candidates are asking. So thank you a lot for joining me today. It's been great working through your questions. For those of you taking the test this coming weekend, uh, I hope uh, that you have a really great test day experience. Um, remember to try and relax a little bit before your test. Uh, you've put a lot of hard work into getting ready. Uh, and so now you need to focus on uh, getting yourself ready for your uh, test day. So I hope it's a really great experience. And um, Shekinah or myself will see you again for another Q&A session soon. Bye for now.